Good afternoon and welcome to Connections Online Showcase 2022. I'm Eric Price, the Exercise Director for the School Good of Advanced afternoon. Military welcome Studies. Welcome to Connections Online Showcase 2022. I'm Eric Price, the Exercise Director. Why is it Safari muted? There it is. Want to go again? Right. Good afternoon and welcome to Connections Online Showcase 2022. I'm Eric Price, the Exercise Director for the School of Advanced Military Studies. I'm Dr. James Sterrett. I'm the Chief of Simulation Education in the Directorate of Simulation Education at the Army Command and General Staff College, which is the, the overarching group that uh, includes the School of Advanced Military Studies. And we are here today to talk about using Root, the commercial board game from Leader Games, in an exercise in SAMS this past uh, August. So one of the things that we're going to start with is how is it that we choose games for classroom use in the first place? And in, in my section, we call it DSE, Director of Simulation Education, we have a mantra that we use, purpose, decisions, interactions. We often refer to this as PDI. So purpose, purpose is what do you want people to learn in the class? Because if we can't identify the, pur the purpose of why we're doing this, then I could ram in any old thing in order to, for example, support Eric. And potentially I'm just wasting his time and his student's time because it doesn't actually match what he needs. So we need to find something that really matches his purpose, which requires that we, as best we can, understand that purpose through a series of discussions with Eric or any other instructor that we are supporting. And in addition to, hey, what's the learning outcome, which is key, it's also understanding how many students do we have? How many groups are they in? How much time do we have? What's the physical space? All of those constraints that are going to weigh upon whether or not a given particular game is in fact going to meet the needs. From that key business of the, of the learning objective, the purpose, we're then working into what are the decisions and dilemmas that the students need to wrestle with in order to get them to that learning. Normally, almost always, the game itself is not really the mechanic that teaches them the thing in the classroom. It's the thing which gives them an experience from which the learning comes through discussion with each other, either in small groups at the table or larger groups in an AR or through structured discussion with their instructor. They come to say, okay, this is the wider application of whatever it might be. We wind up having three ty types of things we do with games in this regard. It could be that it's something that kicks off the class. This is often called a, common ex a concrete experience in the experiential learning model, which is based off of the Kolb cycle. It could be something that's going to be the primary learning in the class, which the CGSC people tend to call the GNI, Generalized New Information, in which you're learning by engaging in a series of problems through the game. And over time, you learn the lesson through that in the discussion. Or it could be more of an apply to show you the that you know something, show the instructors you know something, or to show that you understand the value of something you've been taught and you can put it to, be, put it to good use. Once we understand what's going on with these, which is fundamentally something that we as the support people can't figure out, that has to come from the instructor, then we are running off and finding, all right, what has the interactions that will drive the dilemmas that will get at the purpose? So all games fundamentally are a cycle of, here's a set of information, the player is afforded the opportunity to make sets of decisions about it. The model runs forward and presents you with new information. If it's a first person shooter game, then this may be happening 60 times a second. If on the other hand, it's a really heavy strategic board game, then it might be that you're making this cycle happen once every two or three hours. Typically we've got to run a faster cycle in two or three hours for most of the games that we're running in the classroom. But nonetheless, we've got to make sure that that set of interactions, both the information and the affordances are gonna drive people to wrestle with the things that matter. Over to you, Eric. Yeah, let me talk a little bit about SAM. So the School of Advanced Military Studies is actually made up of three different programs. The first of those is the Advanced Military Studies Program, AMSP, and that's for our mid-career officers and 
civilian partners. That is the second year program for uh, for James's CGSC, the Command and General Staff College. And so a, about 10% of the students that attend CGSC will come to SAMS for a second year and get a graduate degree here. Our second program is the Advanced Strategic Leadership Studies Program, ASLSP, uh, which is for senior officers and civilians and is the equivalent of the U.S. Army War College. And then we have a third program, the Advanced Strategic Planning and Policy Program, ASP3, which is an Army-managed PhD program. So we have students that uh, the Army pays for them to get a PhD. We kind of manage their careers while they're going through their PhD programs, uh, but they actually get their PhDs from a series of, uh, of you know, universities all across the globe. Um, my work is focused primarily on those mid-career officers and AMSP. And as the exercise director, I plan and facilitate multi-day exercises focused on military planning. So uh, what AMSP does is we educate members of the armed forces and our allies and interagency partners to become agile and adaptive leaders, critical and creative thinkers, the sorts of things that you've heard before about what we do in professional military education. Um, CGSC sort of focuses on the science of warfare and what we do at SAMS is we tend to focus a little bit more on the art, how to take doctrine uh, and the experiences that we have, provide a little additional education, and then get our students to uh, a point where when they graduate, they serve as planners primarily in senior headquarters, and they help their commanders understand the complex environments in which we are asked to operate, and then assist those leaders as they seek to visualize, describe, and direct military actions. Our specific focus, again, tends to go beyond military science to the art of employing military power. And, and in, in that way, um, what we do uh, in gaming for our own courseware is uh, very valuable to that. So uh, gaming at SAMS is often focused on illustrating historical cases that we study, which we use to demonstrate complexity uh, and the outcomes that tend to come uh, uh, from interacting within the human domain and how often unpredictable they can be. Those are usually done through very short practical exercises of a day or so with relatively limited scope. And James and his team does a lot to support the school to make those happen. Uh, for our larger exercises, using games is something that is relatively new for our, our school. The decision was essentially made to move to exercises that included at least some sort of gaming uh, because of two uh, primary prompts. The first was guidance from Army leadership on wanting to expand the use of gaming in professional military education. More directly, though, uh, in, in the last year or so, it was from watching what was going on in Ukraine and thinking about how we could leverage some of what was going on there in our learning. And uh, this led us to look at the Krulak Center's uh, operational wargaming system and how we might be able to incorporate that into our curriculum. And so we ordered some of those games early in 2022. But as we began to finish out our last uh, school year this summer, and we were thinking about what to do in our first exercise, we thought that uh, a game of that complexity and really kind of focused on the human domain of warfare would cause the students not to focus on what we wanted them to focus on in our first course, which is really about observing, making decisions, assessing uh, what it is that we're seeing, and then assessing our actions in order to figure out what it is that we're going to do. And so the problem that we put the students in, in in this particular exercise was not to think about how to win in whatever exercise we put them in, but for them to think about how they learned in interacting with an environment and with an adversary. So the reason that we selected Root was that, uh, again, we wanted to try to find something that would allow us to think about uh, thinking. Uh, when I went to James and told him that we were looking for a game that we could play for about a week at the end of our very first course, um, th that was the problem set that I came to him with. In this particular exercise, we wanted to practically experience some of the ideas that were presented in our four-week fundamentals course 
which, as I said, is focused on cognition, how we observe, how we think, how we learn, how we make assessments, and then how we adapt based on new information and how we identify and overcome our own biases in the process of all of those interactions. Now, I don't have a lot of gaming experience myself, at least not as an adult. So I went to James really as kind of a blank slate. Uh, but I also made clear that I wanted something that could focus on decision making, but centered on how we decide more so than the specifics of what we decide. Uh, so in our initial conversations, we looked at several games <laughs> and, and ultimately he even offered me one to take home, uh, the game Nevsky, uh, which was pretty fascinating. It's one that I, I think I would still like to find a way to use or, or, or maybe just to play myself. But in our conversation, James also planted a seed in my brain by mentioning uh, Root, really in passing. He noted that it was about uh, the, the asymmetry of the factions that play in the game. And that word asymmetry really stuck in my head. And so I remember that I came home for the weekend and I was thumbing through the Nevsky rules and spending uh, and then spending much of the weekend trying to find everything that I could on Root. Because after I looked at the first thing, I realized that this seemed like a really good fit. And so I watched uh, several videos. And before the weekend was out, I had ordered a copy for myself. And uh, the bottom line is the reason that, that, that I chose it in terms of my own decision making and, and making a recommendation to, to our leadership was that the design of Root was well suited to our needs it was uh, relatively easy if it's complex, um, and we wanted to eliminate historical bias that might color how students approached a game involving either a similar or familiar campaign or familiar actors uh, in, in an environment that they're already aware of. And most importantly, again, because we wanted them focused on how they were learning about themselves and their adversaries rather than the details of what they were learning. Root really gave us that by putting them in a completely unfamiliar situation and environment with actors that they would have to learn and understand in order to win. The what's that they learned aren't applicable to their careers in the way that they might be in a traditional planning exercise, but the hows most definitely are. I know that one of the things that, the reason that it was mentioned in passing is that on my team, we've known about Root since shortly after it was released a number of years ago, and we thought very highly of it. But we also are aware of the fact that Root looks like a game of fluffy animals running around in the woods, which is potentially going to cause either non-gamers or students who are looking for an out or just want something more apparently serious to say, well, this is terrible. Why should we do that? And it was actually kind of nifty that when we mentioned that it was fluffy animals running around in the woods, Eric lit up and said, perfect, <laughs> specifically because, as he mentioned, he was trying to get them away from history. He was trying to get them away from current ops, away from things they knew in order to break loose their thinking and show them that the tools they'd been learning for the previous four weeks could be applied even in a highly unfamiliar situation. And I, I absolutely had those same thoughts, James, but I'm kind of a contrarian. <laughs> So while I was worried uh, at how people might respond to this suggestion that we were going to do something that was, that does look on its surface, it, it looks like a kid's game. Uh, when you look at the box and you, and, and the beautiful artwork, the first impression is that it, it is some sort of game that I would play with my teenager. And I have played it with my teenager. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know that James has played it with his teenager. And in fact, his teenager came and helped us facilitate in the classroom. Uh, mine was a little too busy with, with uh, school prep to do that, but, um, uh, we didn't really, I didn't really have many of those reactions other than, than maybe from the deputy commandant who, when he came in to visit during exercise execution, we were near the end and we had several of the boxes already back in the front office. And when he walked by the counter on which all these boxes were stacked to come in and get a briefing from us before going down and seeing one of the groups, he did turn one of the boxes around so that he could, so that it was oriented, you know, so that he could read it. And he got kind of a quizzical look on his face. Uh, and so when I briefed him, I did, I did mention, sir, I, I noticed what you saw when you, you know, that, that look on your face when you looked at the game. And, and, and I promise you that what you'll see in the classroom is more than just sort of a playful uh, exercise involving fuzzy animals. It is far, far more than that. 
So, of course, we've got to do a lot of preparation to be able to run it in the classroom. And part of that preparation, <laughs> part of that preparation was getting enough copies of the game, which we had thought was going to be easy and turned out instead to be a little bit of high adventure. Uh, it's in print, but it happened during the summer to be out of print briefly. And we hit that window. So two different, two very different groups came together to help us with that particular problem. First of which was our tapped our support network of people that we know throughout the, the army and the rest of DOD asking for help. And I was really humbled is probably the best word by the fact that, that over a dozen people promptly piped up and said, here, I'll loan you a copy. One person said, here, I'll give you a copy. Bang. And even if we hadn't had the second solution, we got enough copies of the game from people out of the goodness of their heart, just sending them to us to make this happen. Uh, that was amazing. And I'm very, very grateful to them. The second thing that happened is that one of those people, it turned out, knew the people at Leader Games, phoned up the designer, uh, Cole Worley, and said, hey, can you help us? So suddenly they found the number of copies we needed sitting in a warehouse and bang, they were on our doorstep. Uh, because they stepped up to the plate and made it happen. And again, we are very grateful for that. We had hoped, in fact, at one point, if the schedules had worked out, to have Cole speak to the students about the game. Uh, and unfortunately, the schedules just couldn't be lined up. So for the, the next piece of the preparation is that we had to make sure that our people internally, the ones who would be running each of the rooms, running the tables, were going to know the game. So we had probably about three weeks in which most of the people on our team, plus a number of other volunteers who are going to be helping running the tables, spent a lot of their time playing Root. And we were saying, look, you got to play it as each faction, play a full game as each faction, so that you understood each of the four factions. We spent a lot of that time sledgehammering out how are we specifically going to teach it to the students? Because on the one hand, we know that the students are going to have their... Uh, the, the videos we found, they we looked for videos that we liked and sent them that. We know that they're going to read the rules, but equally, it's the case that the vast majority of people don't really learn a game by sitting down with the rules or watching a video and then getting it out and they understand it. What really happens for most people is somebody in the game group learns the game and teaches it to the rest of them, and we can't count on every group, group of students having that person, we are going to be that. That's our role as support. So we hammered out, and that also meant not only coming up with, but testing through, how are we going to run the tutorial and how to play the game on the first day? Uh, as is fairly typical for us, what we aimed for was a play along tutorial in which for the first, in this case, the first player faction for the first turn for each player faction, we say, look, you are going to do the following things. We're going to make you do these actions. And the actions were set up so that everybody would see all the major systems in the game. They're set up so that we could talk through why would you do this at this time so they can understand how the logic of it fits in. And we also, a key thing with Root, given that the Root player aids are spectacularly well done, and the sequence of play that you can read off of each of the player cards tells you what to do next. We made them read out loud, what's your player card say? You know, read the whole thing. And that also seemed to work very well in driving home for students and when we were teaching it to internally to our team for teaching how the game really functioned. So Eric, over to you. Yeah. Uh and just a more a uh, couple more comments on uh, on preparations before uh, before we executed in the classroom. James also uh, uh, and his team came over and did a a separate facilitation event with our military faculty, who were also going to be in uh, the classroom, kind of watching what the students were doing, helping students tie it back to our curriculum. And this the military faculty were probably a little less patient than our students were, uh, in part because, you know, the, they, they want to make sure they understand what it is that they're doing and, and uh, so that they don't look bad in front of the students, which I fully understand. Um, so that was a little difficult. And I think um, we came out of that with a, with a mixed bag of feelings from our military faculty on how well this was going to work, which was 
something that we didn't have when when we first pitched it to them. So I almost thought that I had derailed the process by um, not scheduling more time and maybe a little bit uh, different effort with them, like getting them over to do the training that uh, that James was doing for his crew. And I went over and participated in that to make sure that I understood uh, the game well before we got to execution. Um, the other preparations that we did um, really were kind of the, the directions that we gave to the students and faculty before we started. So we, we generally uh, tried to keep the students in the dark about what it was that we were going to do, but the scuttlebutt was certainly out there. There were students that went and found the uh, online version or the, uh, the app version of the game to play on their mobile devices. Uh, and that probably accelerated learning for some of the groups because they had people that had already played a little bit. However, in their final instructions before the exercise started, um, and this was like the day before or the Friday before, I reiterated to the students that uh, the focus was not on, again, on the what of what they were doing. Uh, so it wasn't really focused on winning, but it was on how they were interacting with the game, with each other, and and what they would learn that related to what they had learned in the classroom in the four weeks beforehand. And as such, I suggested, uh, probably really more like implored, that they didn't go out and seek all the hacks and guides that you can find out there online to help you figure out how to win, which happens to be great if you're learning how to win one faction. But if you're trying to learn how to win them all, um, maybe you don't have the time to commit to do that anyway with the other things that uh, we had to do. So when we actually did run it in the classroom, the way we designed it was uh, we were going to run a dozen games simultaneously, essentially. And our first day of the exercise out of four days would be using that walkthrough play that, that James mentioned that is provided in the game by Leader Games. And that worked very, very well. I think when you have someone actually read the script, which explains what they're doing and why they're doing it in the context of the game, they begin to they begin to appreciate the general mechanics of the game, uh, and and figure out very quickly how to apply that to moves beyond that. So, once the groups finished with the I think it was just two turns around the table with the 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 practice walkthrough, we allowed them to play that game through to completion, and and really use that time to kind of focus on rules because they would obviously run up against things that they weren't prepared to understand how to do. And then we gave them time to plan for what they would do the next day based on whatever observations they came away from the planning with. And then on each of our exercise days, the next three days, the teams would play a game in the morning and then they would spend time sort of capturing observations from, from that game and tying it back to the curriculum and to the, the different theories that they've studied or different authors that they looked at. And then they would sort of make a plan of attack for the next game. And uh, we'll show you later, but some of the students even went so far as to kind of develop tools to guide their gameplay. You know, the, the root game equivalent of an execution matrix or, de or a decision support template. And, uh, and I thought that was pretty interesting that they, that they really did try to think about how they were, they were going to pursue the objectives of their faction against uh, against their adversaries. We, we tried to add to the focus of learning by keeping our student pairs, and we did have students work as pairs. So it was eight students to a table, two students each working together as a pair. Uh, we had them stay in the same faction for as long as possible. And uh, so unlike the training that James was giving to his facilitators, uh, where he wanted us to play all of the factions, so we had an un uh, understanding of how the entire game worked, we wanted them to learn about themselves and about the environment and about their adversaries through observation and interaction rather than suddenly becoming the other side. We don't get to join the Chinese army to figure out how the Chinese military works. We have to do it through observation and often third party observation. Um, and the reason that we use student pairs was because we were focused on how we were learning we wanted students to have to verbalize that. So their discussions between students who are working together on a faction would, um, would make explicit some of the things that they were experiencing and the links that they were making back to our own courseware. And I, I thought that was really, uh, really important to do that. 
James, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, execution in the classroom in terms of facilitation? Yeah, so as Eric has mentioned, we did all this, this series of repeated games. Uh, and by the way, I should note, one of the people who wound up facilitating is a current SAM student, Dan Warner, who was speaking earlier today about a war game that he designed. Uh, so you should definitely hook back into that particular talk as well. The, on, the, on day, a line that we draw is that if people are learning the game on day one in this sort of a setup, then we'll give you a little bit more help but after that, we try to give you less help. If you have a rules question, we will always answer it. But usually the place that we try to draw a pretty firm line is that if you tell me what you want to accomplish in the game, you have a plan and you're trying to figure out how to do it under the rules, we will tell you how to do it under the rules. But if you're saying, what should my plan be? You know, that's not something we're supposed to help you. You're supposed to figure that out on your own. And one of the things we were very pleased by is that as the first teach through seemed to work well, because increasingly the questions we were getting were fine points on the rules, as opposed to broad stroke, you know, is it possible to do X, Y, or Z? One of the reasons we got this particular picture lined up for this slide is that the two guys in the middle, the Marine and the army officer with gray hair who are conferring together, on one of the last days, one of the teams of students had to be somewhere else. And I was brutally forced to have to play Root, which was of course terrible. Uh, the, the copy of Root we have at home for what it's worth has been played so much I was forced to sleeve the cards because they are wearing out. So I've played the cats a number of times before. I figure I know what I'm doing. And I figure, hey, it's students, they haven't played this before this week. So, you know, off we go. And I was, they were the eerie as they are in that picture. And they started off with an unusual choice of leader, the one who recruits extra as opposed to the one who builds. And normally standard eerie strategy is you choose the one who builds. And I noticed this and stupidly chalked it up to their inexperience. Well, four turns in, they uncork a corner dominance card, they can win if they own two opposite corners of the map, which is an unusual win condition. They had successfully set up for it by building a large force to hold the corners. And they had successfully deceived everyone else around the map, including me, as to what they were doing by pretending that they were fighting for the center. They didn't win only because I found a really narrow way as the cats to hold them off and I spent the rest of the, of the game not winning to keep them from losing while, of course, the other two factions said, thank you. That's kind. We can't actually help. And I'm saying, yeah, right. <laughs> but it was beautifully, spectacularly well done. Uh, and I, I complimented them with time. And I've been telling this story ever since. It was a great, great illustration for me of the ways in which the students were using the planning and analytic tools that they've been taught in the first four weeks and applying them in order to achieve victory in this initially unfamiliar environment. It was really spectacularly well done. The, uh, the other thing that I should mention here while we're talking about it is the two students to one player position is very much something that we try to do every chance that we possibly can. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First, if you are one student on the player position, you're new to the game, you may only be playing it once, you are alone and typically, while well, you may not be willing to admit it, you are afraid. A lot of them are sitting there saying, I don't know the game, I've never done this before. And if it's just you facing off against somebody, then they tend to clam up and they don't play very well and they're very unsure. When you've got a battle buddy, you're a lot more able to handle the situation. You've got somebody to talk with, somebody to strategize with, somebody to bounce something off. You've got somebody fundamentally who's in, on your corner along with you. And we found that as a result, students tend to do far better in that particular situation that they've got that battle buddy. Also, in almost all cases, as Eric mentioned, it forces them to talk about what they're going to do. And as the instructor, that means that you can be listening in and you're getting points for the AR, or you're getting points to possibly bring in immediately. But either way, you have a window into the students' minds right away. The last point I'd make about that is that it is really useful when you can 
to have the facilitator and the instructor be different people. The facilitator is trying to make the game run. And you're really, ideally, you are in the zone of watching the game, watching the students, trying to figure out whether or not they need a question answered. You know, you're the one, you're sitting there with a focus on what they're doing to keep the game going. Somebody picks up a rule book and you can jump in and say, hey, what's the question? Somebody looks confused, frustrated, you're jumping on that to try and keep things smooth. That's a very different kind of focus from the instructor who is sitting there and saying, hey, are we getting to where we need to with this game? Are they learning the things they need to? Are they coming up with discussion points we want for later? And as a result, having two different people allows a really much better focus on those two important aspects of this. Let's slide onwards to how well did this work in addressing the needs of exercise one? And I'm going to hand this over to Eric in just a minute, but note that this slide and the next slide are all pictures of analyses or commentary that the students put up on the whiteboard, largely without any faculty prompting. Eric, over to you. Yeah, thanks, James. And, and that really kind of does get back to your last point um, uh, with regard to facilitation and having a facilitator and an instructor who are two separate people. So uh, our seminar leaders, the role that they actually played uh, in, in the course of the exercise, quite frankly, was trying to get the students to have these discussions, uh, helping lead these hot washes when uh, when the uh, each of the 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 short uh, exercises were over. So after they would finish gameplay and they would do that hot wash, and uh, they were there to steer when necessary or to uh, to ask leading questions to get students to. Uh, maybe talk about something that uh, that they had discussed during the game that they didn't bring up in the hot wash, but that this was a lot of self discovery for the for the students themselves, and quite frankly, the result was a lot better than I expected. Uh, I will admit we had a few students who probably got a little too focused on trying to master the game for the purpose of of winning, but most that I saw really used it as a tool to practice the concepts that they had been taught in the course up to that time. And as I said, I was worried that there would be uh, resistance to it, either from the leadership or the students, because it didn't resemble traditional gaming tools that we had used in the program up to that point. And because it's easy to dismiss this as unserious, if you only you know, judge this particular book by, you know, by the cover art. Uh, but my worries were completely unfounded. The students quickly made connections between our curriculum and their learning experiences inside the game. And so uh, a couple of quotes here that I've collected that I think are pretty valuable. One student said that, uh, quote, Root was very effective in demonstrating the various components of fundamentals, the course that they'd just gone through. We had various conversations on all of the learning topics, even without realizing that we were doing it. We were engaging with and tested several theories. Uh, end quote. Uh, another student who was uh, perhaps a, a little more direct said, uh, quote, it is incredible how much one dorky game brought together all of the aspects of fundamentals, operational art, and inadvertently brought students to conduct a quasi MDMP military decision making process to understand yourself, the enemy and the changes in the operational environment. Kudos to whoever brought the idea. I guess that would be me, but really James, because he's the one that planted that seed in my brain. Uh, and they said the exceptional choice and I and exceptional choice and eye opening on how to think outside the box to foment intellectual, professional, and critical thinkers. Now, an example of of sort of this uh, incorporation of the curriculum uh, by the students themselves in the course of their discussions and some of the work that they put up on the boards is uh, one of the books that we read is Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. And one of the ideas he discusses there is this idea of what you see is all there is. And this concept is sort of like confirmation bias, but it, it's broader than that. It's the notion that our brains are wired to believe that the information that we have is really all the relevant info there is, whether it's confirming or not or at least that it's enough information to proceed with whatever it is that we want to do. And that becomes a problem because then we tend to not look for the things that we don't see, even if those things might be 
uh, impactful on whatever it is that we're trying to do. And the way that I saw this play out during uh, gameplay itself was that I saw initially that student pairs were very focused on kind of playing their own game without regard to what anyone else was doing. So they would be, um, you know, operating as a faction and thinking about what their faction was supposed to do. Uh, if you were the cats, you know, to build, to, to recruit and to attack. And, and they would get so focused on that, that things would be happening on the board and they would just have no clue because they were very focused on their own game. And this is, again, because we didn't really prep the students ahead of time to understand how everybody works. We let them discover that through the course of their gameplay. In subsequent games, the teams would often get completely focused on the Erie, for instance, because they were the largest and brightest thing on the board. And they would completely ignore the lone vagabond or the almost invisible uh, Woodland Alliance that was on the board. And as, uh, as the games went on, they would begin shifting their focus from themselves, again, to whatever the sort of the most obvious thing was going on the board, or whoever had won the last game would become the, the, the object of focus for all of the factions in the next game. And so they were again, still fixated on what was most visible rather than what was most important for them. And I think that uh, that this dynamic in the game, to me at least, it suggests some really deliberate and brilliant sort of game design in the way that it plays on our natural cognitive tendencies as human beings. And, and I do think that that is, uh, I do think that's really valuable. Certainly one of the things that we, that, on, so we started this on a, a Monday and sort of quietly alongside talking to Eric and the other facilitators and the other faculty who were you know, observing and as the higher level faculty. The point at which we were suddenly all quietly giving each other big thumbs up and grinning is that by noon on day two, stuff like we're showing on the screen now and on the next one was beginning to sprout up of its own accord. Uh, as Eric noted, what you see is all there is, which was prop popping up particularly frequently, often as W-S-I-A-T-I, -I, just written in big letters. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it showed rapidly that it was working, working particularly well. Uh, there was definitely some students were frustrated that they didn't get to play all the other factions, to which we always pointed them back to Eric's point that you don't get to go to the Chinese Staff College to learn how the Chinese fight, you have to learn it through observation. And at some levels they were grumpy about that and at some levels they accepted it. We know that, and that, that's the wider point of this story, we know that there are things that students will get grumpy about in using a game in a classroom that are nonetheless highly useful in using it in education. One of the electives that I co-teach with Dr. John Abel from the history department at CGSC is it's called officially History in Action, Case Studies and Decision-Making. The unofficial title is History Through War Games. And we go through eight three-hour classes and there's a different game in each. And the students will always tell us, hey, we should play each game twice because the second time we can play it to win it. And the thing we always reply is, you learn 80% of what we want you to learn about the history that's the point of this class from the first play of the game. You've grappled with and you've understood the most of the basics of the model. We've talked about how that illuminates whatever it is that is the topic for the day. And then let's drive on to the next one. But you're welcome to sign this game out and take it home, play with your classmates or your buddies over the weekend. And sometimes they take us up on that and sometimes they don't. You know, it varies. We know that will come up, but also by looking back at what's the objective of this exercise. We sometimes know that the thing that students want to do for fun is not the thing that we need to do for learning. Um, well, and I, I know I know for myself sorry. that uh, I know for myself that in the first two iterations of the game that I played, I got my backside kicked pretty hard, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot more from that than I did coming close to winning in the next two games. So, uh, I, I definitely think there's more learning going on in losing than there is in in the victory that comes afterwards. So. One of the particular examples of a, a, it's up there on the board. This is the upper 
seminar four table one thing. You see that sort of chain of boxes leading running around. So this was a particular student's hobby course that he spent a great deal of time talking with with his fellows about how this was going to work out in the next game, and he had predictions on it. But his prediction was that basically you win in one game, which means that you get bullied in the next game, which means that some other faction wins in, the, in that game, so they get bullied in the next game, and that there's going to be this chain in which whoever's been bullied least recently will win the next game and on and around. And there's layers at which he is correct in that Root is well enough balanced that much of the key in the game balance for who wins is table diplomacy. Some of the factions will come out of nowhere, it will seem to the others, come out of nowhere with these sudden exponential point gains that they spent the rest of the, of the game leading up to. And some of them have a much more linear point gain, and therefore they're the obvious targets at the beginning. Uh, as you'll see in the next slide, one of the, probably the most infamous for that is the vagabond, also often called the thief by the students, who often comes out of nowhere, it seems like they're doing nothing, and then suddenly, haha, they won. Uh, a lot of what you see is all there is uh, the comments. But it's that sort of systemic thinking about the game that I was often impressed by by a lot of students. I'm going to slide on to the next one initially to talk about some of the uh, student commentary. So you can see that in one of these rooms, for table number one in the room, game number three, their first observation is attack the vagabond. And then after game number four, their first observation is attack the thief, although they apparently had tried it and learned that while it's a single marker on the board, in fact, it often can develop a great deal of combat power and kick you around. So they subtitled it Beatings for All, which I was pretty amused by. The other piece of this that's worth taking a look at is you've got a plan by one side trying to figure out how they're going to win the game as the cats. So they're worried about what's my objective? What's the logic that the system works by? What's the operational approach? What's the enemy's objectives? You know, they've identified sort of the center. What's the means of winning for each of the four factions? The cats need to build, the eagles need to roost, the alliance needs to spread, the vagabond needs to do one of three things, which could be alliance or beating people up or questing. They've identified that as the cats, the things they need to do are defending their keep and their sawmills and secure this particular towns and killing the birds, the, the eerie, the eagles. Uh, you can see they've got their operational approach. They've got a series of decision points. And if you sort of sanded all of the, the rootness, if you will, off of this, then this wouldn't necessarily look out of, out of place in somebody trying to do MDMP on an operation. They're figuring, hey, what are, the, what are the objectives? What are the centers of gravity for each side? What's our operational approach? Where are decision points? How do we recognize them? What are the conditions that we're going to hit? So this was, again, something that we were pretty impressed to see pop up and you know, show up. Eric, any other comments? Uh, well, on that on that one particular product, their their decision points are pretty detailed. So uh, decision point number one, if, if the alliance has three bases and one base is destroyed, then, then focus on their sympathy. If I'm in last place, coax the vagabond into a coalition. Um, when I choose to move from building to recruiting or from recruiting to attack. And if I have a dominance card, uh, what do I what do I do then in terms of making the decision on when to play it? And so, uh, I mean, they they really went into a lot of depth in in thinking about how they were dealing with the problems that they were faced with in this game. And I thought it was pretty fascinating. Again, it's even even in getting focused on trying to figure out how to win, they were constantly going back and thinking about what am I learning through these engagements in order to figure out how to win, which of course, you know, was the larger point of the game. And I, I, I was just really pleased at our ability to kind of get there. Stitching back to something we talked about way back at the beginning is why did we choose root? So having gone through all of this and seeing the, seeing the success, let's, let's stitch back to that and why it is that root succeeded. We knew that Eric came to us asking for something that was going to help them use all of these planning tools that would jolt them out of their comfort zone, that would be something that they weren't used to, something that they, they I do not, 
something that would be a game that was simple enough for them to learn and play multiple times over the course of the week. His initial target, I think, was six times over the course of the week. And yet it needed to have the depth that it would sustain their interest and their competition and therefore their use of the various planning and analytic tools over the course of all of those plays. And one of the things that happened is we brought up a whole chain of, of perfectly good, potentially viable games that work for this. They lacked in various departments in trying to get this done. They wouldn't jolt students far enough out of their comfort zone because they were too familiar or they were easy to learn, but they would take, they wouldn't sustain five or six or seven repeated right after another plays without having students probably feel that they'd sucked all the juice out of it. They wouldn't have the kinds of asymmetry that Root has built in. So that's why it is that eventually we brought up Root because Mike Dunn, my partner in crime in many of these things, he and I were talking about this and realized it answered the mail on all of them. It's got that wonderfully done asymmetry. There is an incredible amount of depth to the game and therefore it would sustain and support all of the objectives that Eric and his crew had for the exercise at Sam's. Uh, in addition to that, James, we, uh, we also had the ability to induce friction with this particular game um, if the students were getting a little too comfortable. So for instance, uh, we did uh, provide a reframing event to, uh, to make sure that we could add a wrinkle when the, when the students thought that they had sorted it all out by flipping over to the winner side of the board in which the suits of the different areas that you're trying to operate in are randomized. And that means that your understanding of the terrain where you sort of knew which clearings or which corners or whatever you needed to control to win as your faction suddenly didn't apply anymore, uh, which I think was very valuable. And in, and in at least one instance, I know that Dan Warner and his group, he actually introduced a new faction, in, <laughs> which uh, maybe induced more <laughs> friction than, than, uh, than the group was ready for. But uh, again, it was still a very good experience for the students in that regard. We also changed, I, I know that in the rooms that I was supporting, uh, they changed the lineups so that the first couple days you were facing exactly the same pairs as each faction. And then they scrambled who you were going to be facing at the various tables so that in effect, people play the various factions with a personality. Yes. And I might be aggressive or I might be more of a turtle or I might be a builder or whatever. And you start to develop your strategy on the assumption that, well, I know how Eric plays and now I will adapt to that. But now I suddenly swap in Eric for you know, Chris or Merle or whoever. And suddenly it's a, it's a different game because they're not going to play in the manner that you expect. And, and at least a handful of the groups did, uh, ultimately move some students around to different factions in some cases, leaving one student with a faction who was experienced, who could kind of, you know, guide the second person, but getting that, that fresh set of eyes in there to think about operationally, how they were going to go about doing what they did. And I, I think overall the variety of, uh, of approaches that we sort of ended up with that all the seminars started in the same place on, on the first day and, uh, by the time we got to the middle of day three and four, uh, seminars were doing things a little bit differently, uh, which is great. This was our first iteration doing it. So we got to uh, not only experiment broadly with using Root as, uh, as our tool, but also we got to experiment with the ways in which that we uh, incorporated Root into our courseware. And so we can do th things a little bit differently next time, potentially. And I, I see we have a question here from Bayonet Brandt. Uh, how many of them track down the game and maybe even expansions for personal play outside the class? Did you convert any gamers in the crowd? Uh, I, I'll start on this one, I guess. Uh, as I said, there were several students that went out and, and got the, uh, the app version for their mobile devices. Uh, some of our faculty as well that uh, dug into that very quickly. Um, I have I have already bought a couple of expansion sets and gotten myself the uh, the rollout uh, play mat so I don't have to use the folding board. 
Um, that, uh, but there were several students that uh, talked about the game and their interest in playing it again. Uh, I don't know how many have gone out and bought the board game. The board game can be a little tricky to get still. It is in high demand, but, uh, um, but several of them uh, indicated an interest to play again. And uh, we've offered to have them come up to the classroom and check out a copy from our classroom if they, if they would like to play. Uh, I have asked them to please invite me because I would like to play games at work rather than uh, doing some of the other stuff I have to do. Yeah, I know that we also we also were being were routinely being told that the uh, that students had either bought the board game more even more often bought the computer game version of it and bought all the bits. Uh, I think that's really a question for me. Do I have an online list of the eight games that I play in history through war games? Uh, is that online somewhere? I'm not sure the most up-to-date list is there. Uh, it, so part of the answer is that it changes from, from iteration to iteration. The current list, and it, it seems weird to be struggling a list of only eight, but I know the first one is Battle for Moscow, the Victory Point Games introductory game, version of the introductory game, uh, which we use in part simply because it is a very good introductory game. I can't assume for the History Through Wargaming course that we're going to have wargamers all coming in or experienced gamers. So it's, it's a good starting point. The second thing we run is Drive on Paris from MMP. Again, a relatively simple hex and counter war game, but it is much bigger in the number of counters. So typically we will go from Battle for Moscow, Drive on Paris. One of the learning points that we hit them with is the fact that the area shown by the map, sort of the number of square kilometers that are on each of those maps is the same. You can fit the entire Western front of World War I into the, the Battle for Moscow map, which is maybe a sixth of the linear distance of the uh, Eastern Front of World War II, let alone the, uh, let alone the square, square area of it. We then sliding backwards through time, we go to Napoleon 1807 from Shaco Games. We found that that's a really great look at operational Napoleonic operational warfare, really puts students to think about the problem of move separately, fight concentrated. Uh, we like 1807 because specifically, we haven't had a chance to put 1815 to the test for this yet, uh, because the French and the Russian armies are relatively balanced as compared to their 1806 game, which is brilliant and we use it with Sam's, but Jena Auerstadt is going to go badly for the Prussians pretty much every single time. And we'd rather have them on a more even footage. It also starts the discussion of the difference between the continuous fronts, more or less, that you're seeing in World Wars One and Two, back to the march maneuver, uh, what uh, not trying to feel if what uh, Isserson would call the strategy of a single point in the Napoleonic Wars. We drift a little bit further back through time to Friedrich, which moves from the total wars of Napoleonic World War One, World War Two, back into the cabinet warfare and they're edging them into seeing a different form of warfare as they're realizing that you shouldn't necessarily fight every time you can. You should think about whether or not a battle is worth risking. And the earliest game we run is Nevsky. Uh, Nevsky is also one of the two most complex games we run for two reasons. One, it's, there's a lot to Nevsky. But second, it is the game that really winds up being in an alien mindset for them. Now, what do you mean I have to tell my lords that they have to come and campaign and they're going to leave after a time? And I have to keep them happy and I have to you know, give them money if I want them to stick around longer. And the thing that is probably the most complained about thing in Nevsky for them is you can't plan to win a battle. You can plan towards hoping to win a battle, but the dice can and will go against you. And sure things can turn out to be utter disasters for the player initiates it. And when they complain about this, we point out to them, your historical counterparts in that era also avoided battle whenever they had the chance because they don't need, uh, they, they know that they can't predict the outcome of a battle with certainty. So 
if you can get through things through maneuver, then you're better off. And they realize also in Nevsky that what amounts to, in a sense, back to World War II, strategic warfare, burning and pillaging your enemy's rear area is a great way to win the war. Strategic bombardment. So Nevsky is also a very logistics heavy game. So we've had a chain of operationally centered games. Nevsky is the hinge. And we go back to World War II, starting with Nevsky with, in effect, Nevsky looks at class one. All you're worried about is food. We then move forward to supply lines of the American Revolution, where you've got classes one and five. You've got food and you've got ammunition, but the ammunition is not really the, the, the bulk supply item still with supply lines of the American Revolution. And then we move to 1944 Race of the Rhine, which is a World War II supply the drive across France, logistics focused game, war game. And now you've got classes one, three, and five. You've got food, you've got fuel, you've got ammo, and the fuel and the ammo in their bulk utterly dwarf, the, sorry, the fuel, yeah, the fuel and the ammo utterly dwarf the food in terms of the bulk. And so that's a driver for a discussion of over the course of these three, notice how logistics has changed over that 600 year period and why it's changed. Last and not least, we wind up running Triumph and Tragedy, which is a strategic look at uh, World War II competition and conflict leading to potentially World War II in Europe from 36 to 45, and probably the best dime game we've ever found. Dime being an analytic construct, diplomatic, information, military, economic. So it's a really good way to sort of round out the, the course at the end. And despite the fact that in many ways, Triumph and Tragedy is about as complex as Nevsky, Students find it less complex simply because the situation and the logic of why things are happening is much less, uh, much less unfamiliar to them. I think I saw a question pop up in there. Yeah, we do. We have another uh, question from uh, Bayonet Brandt. He said, y'all mentioned some internal resistance from the faculty, probably because Root looks like, quote, the war for the petting zoo, end quote. But once the exercise started, how well, if at all, did they come around? Uh, my impression from our discussions uh, as the game was being uh, or the exercise was being executed and then in our uh, in our formal process of, of, of conducting our own after action review, if you will, on our on our education uh, materials, uh, th the response was was very positive, not just from the students, but also from the faculty. I know that I, we had faculty members that that bought the app version of the game so that they could learn how to play it on their own uh, to be better at it. Uh, uh, I hope that, uh, like the earlier question about uh, whether or not we made any student converts, I'm hoping that we've made a few faculty converts in that process. And then I see we have a last one here uh, from Bayonet Brandt. Uh, he says the last one from him for now, anyway. Uh, what, if any, games are now under consideration for subsequent classes now that Root seems to have been a qualified success? Um, I can tell you that right now we're looking at trying to figure out how to incorporate the operational war game series uh, into an exercise this year, if we can. If we do that, we will do it uh, in a manner similar to the way the Marine Corps does it for us. So the Marine Corps... Uh, uh, introduced Assassin's Mace. They, they facilitate one of our exercises for us. And they introduced Assassin's Mace this last school year. Um, and uh, they used the game on the front of their exercise for doing the approach from the sea in order to conduct a joint forcible entry uh, amphibious operation. And then the planning exercise itself was focused on the subsequent land operations. If we are able to make this work, what we want to do is have the students do the military planning uh, associated with uh, probably Europe. I think that's where we're going to go. I was interested in the Arctic, but there's, uh, I, there's too much maritime involved there for me to think we can pull it off well with students. Um, but we would have them plan for six days or so. Uh, then we'll give them a prep day to kind of uh, make sure they understand the mechanics of the game. And then we would let them execute the plan that they developed uh, in the course of a, of a three-day tabletop exercise. And if it completes early, we'll let them reset. Obviously, they can make decisions over the course of the game to change their plan based on their decision support tools. Uh, and I think that would be a good way 
for them to maybe get some objective feedback on some of the plans that they do. Students are very used to getting our subjective feedback on their planning that, uh, that you know, annexes are incomplete or, or maybe our uh, inf intel requirements are not appropriate for the problem that we're dealing with or whatever. But getting something that's a little more objective because, again, the enemy comes up and punches you in the face uh, mm -hmm. is, a, I think, a good thing to do for the, for the students to take away something from their planning process. We should note that we have run uh, my group and also the Marine Corps MAGTAF training program has run Assassin's Mace for you guys in the past, but we're now discussing essentially a different construct from the way that we've run it in the past. So, right. I'm assuming that once you guys figure out what it is you want, you will be coming to us to let us know. I will. Yeah. I'm a, just waiting to get done teaching right now. Yeah. A, uh, a slightly more extended answer to that question. There are a number of things that we either routinely run or have run for either all of SAMS or for individual instructors at SAMS or groups of instructors at SAMS over the years. And I suspect this is an incomplete list despite my efforts to be quietly compiling it on the side here. Uh, two of the things that we have for the past couple of years have run for all of SAMS at different points in curriculum. Uh, the first one is diplomacy. Uh, diplomacy is part of them looking at how the international system works. So they go out and they experience the maximal realist version of it. Uh, one of the entertaining pieces of feedback from students sometimes is, well, we want one that's not strictly realist. We want one that reflects, and they'll choose some other uh, international theory of international relations. They want it to be that. Mostly they're wanting the game to be less backstabbing and less, <laughs> less cruel and mean. Possibly our, our favorite story about uh, diplomacy is quite a few years ago now, and we were running, this was before COVID, so we were all packed into one big conference room to run this for 120 students. And so there's, this is important because there's a lot of noise in the room. So I'm running one of these tables and we're between, they're doing the discussions between moves for diplomacy. And Dr. Amanda Nagel, who is one of their, one of the faculty at SIMS, comes over to get a briefing from the student who's standing there. And the student who was part of the Russian team at that table happily explains to her that he is not worried about having the Turks invade Ukraine, even though there's no Russian army protecting it because, quote, if they did that, that would be crossing an international border and that would mean a war. And she and I walked about 10 feet away, at which point, because of the number of people in the room, we're effectively on the far side of the moon. And she turned to me with this look of absolute and utter glee and said, aren't they adorable? <laughs> and, uh, they learned <laughs> Ukraine was Turkish with a short order. <laughs> uh, so we're running that typically. Uh, we also typically, for all of them, we are running Napoleon 18, uh, sorry, we're running Hold Fast Korea during the block on the Korean War. Hold Fast Korea is a easy game to learn the rules for. And in some ways, the structure of it is brilliant for Sam's because at the beginning of each of your turns, you get points that you can use to either make your units move or make them fight, and you can do it in any order you like. So Samsters who have spent this year studying operational art and the business of sequencing their operations towards a goal are now suddenly put in the position of having to do it. And some of them, some of them run really well. And some of them find that this is much more difficult than briefing it on a slide but it's a good way to both get them into the problem of the Korean war and to get them to wrestle with planning the sorts of things they've been talking and executing the sorts of things they've been talking about all year. Uh, why not use some of the games designed in the MMAS program that I run that I'll talk about that in the answer for some opportunity training in other programs, just not a good topical fit or too much production work needed to get enough copies. Uh, so often the answer, the MMAS program, MMAS is the Master's in Military Arts and Science program, which is the master's degree that you can work for while you're at CGSC. You've got a number of other MA programs that CGSC will assist you in going through, but that's the one that's run by CGSC. 
In that, I run a track on war game design. So you both write your paper and you have to design a war game. And the paper, the, the master's thesis, is defending your war game design. Often the answer is it's not a topical fit. One way or another, the topic, the treatment, the length, whatever it might be, doesn't happen to suit what's in the classroom. There are two exceptions, one of which is that Dan Warner this year, Major Dan Warner, who's at SAMS this year, was one of our students last year, is using the game that he built, Decisive Operations, in class with the full assistance and agreement of his instructors in there. And I gather, at least according to him, it's been doing quite well. I'm not surprised. He did a pretty nifty game that's focused on planning your operations in time as well as in space in order to achieve victory in a division on division fight. The, while it's not a Sam's example, the other key example of a game that has been pulled into use at one of the CGSC uh, courses, there's the School of Command preparation for people who are about to be battalion and brigade commanders. And not all of them are focused on being maneuver commanders. Some of them are commanding support units or medical units or what have you. And a number of years ago, one of the students in our program built a really good game on the, the high level of operating and deploying and redeploying a field hospital. So S School of Command Prep on several occasions now has used that game called Death Can Wait in order to provide the non-maneuver, non-sort of pointy end people with a much more relevant uh, brigade and division, I'm sorry, brigade or battalion level exercise. But those are the, uh, those are the keys there. So uh, for our moderator, would you like us to keep on talking about some of the other games we run specifically for SAMS or is there another question that's waiting in the wings? I don't so, see any additional questions in the chat there. Oh, and it looks like uh, we've got to please continue. So the uh, a few of the others that come to mind that we've run, uh, we often run the a Napoleonic 1824 style Kriegspiel for some of the instructors, because often there is a block on the Prussian army on Clausewitz and Germany, and they want to give them some taste of what was warfare actually like back when those guys were around. Kriegspiel also is a good chance for them to have to deal with a very dense fog of war, which most tabletop games won't give them. Uh, we have often used supply lines of the American Revolution as a game for them to fight through some of the problems that you're facing in the American Revolution. I gather that this year the American Revolution may have dropped out of curriculum. And thus, this, the game got dropped out as well. Uh, we have on occasion used a, uh, an unpublished game called Sea Powers that Chris Weave, who's helping run this conference, was one of the designers for, uh, in order to get at discussions of technology development. So in all of these cases, though, the thing that comes first is that either an exercise director for the whole college, like Eric Price, or a individual instructor is coming with us and saying, this is the need that I've got. What have you got that can answer it? And then we are running off to see what it is that we can do for them. Uh, Marshall Miller, do I have students play games in pairs in the design course? So the, the answer there is typically no, because in the, I'm gonna give you three answers to this probably by the end. So. There are two different design courses that I teach. One of them is a super accelerated one that is taught during electives. I only get 12 sessions on that over the course of a month. So it's done in a dead sprint. In that, the only game that they wind up playing that is not one of theirs is Battle for Moscow on day one. So they've got an example because I can't assume that students come in knowing what a war game is. And uh, when, they, when they play that, they do play that in pairs. After that, all of the gameplay in that course is students bringing in their designs and facilitating their game design for their peers and getting feedback, which by design, each student will have their game played twice. So typically, all too often, this is normal and it's part of the learning. The first round, it comes in, they think that it is absolutely wonderful and it is ready to go and it is perfect. And they discover that no, this was a flaming wreck that may not have even really gotten out of the driveway. But they learn from that. They learn that iteration is a key part of the process. And you look for the errors 
and you try to fix them and you test it again, you find new errors and you fix them and you try it again and again and again in order to bang your game design into shape. With the master's crew, I've got all year. And the equivalent course that we teach for them in the fall, they're deliverable for the course by Thanksgiving. They have to come in with their first draft of their game design. Uh, and while we start off with a lot of sort of theory and quick examples at the beginning, we've got typically about six to eight weeks in there in which we're doing what we call critical play. So if you were going to teach people filmmaking, one of the things you would have them do is watch a lot of movies. And you're not watching the movies say, whoa, cool explosion. Yeah, hand me the popcorn. You're watching the movies to say, all right, how did they put this thing together? How did they craft it? Why did you block the actors this way? Why did you have this shot? Why did you follow with that shot? Why is that this transition? You know, why is the lighting the way it is? You're discussing the craft of the way that the movie was built. So in a similar manner, we've got that six to eight weeks, six to eight sessions, meetings, in which we're saying, all right, you know, Eric is doing a game on X and Chris is doing a game on Y. And there is some kind of, of overlap in mechanics or topic. And therefore, Eric and Chris, today, you guys are going to be playing this. And so typically, it's not in pairs for that because the overlaps are typically not that large. Students do a wide, wide variety of topics for this. Uh, and it's just those two. Plus, honestly, we are expecting those guys, those guys, those gals, it's both, to, to learn to learn more about the game on their own and be less afraid of trying it on their own than I expect from a random, less self-selected student, if you will, than the, than the master's program students, who we, I think, reasonably expect more from. Eric, do you have anything, any final comments you'd like to leave? Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, when we were talking about kind of pulling all of this together to make uh, to make this exercise happen, um, that we we ran into some uh, supply chain uh, issues that <laughs> I thought might cost me my job before it was all said and done. Uh, and and I just uh, I want to extend thanks to a couple of groups. First of all, you and your gaming network, um, who really came together to uh, uh, to help us when we thought we weren't going to have any games at all other than our two, which was not going to cover, you know, 100 plus students. Uh, and and I thought that was really fabulous, the way that 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 the gamer community, their their willingness to either share a game with us or in some cases I know they said, I'm sending it to you, just keep it. Uh, that was really generous. And I think, uh, I, I think it was great for us. Uh, and, and the other uh, sort of kudo that I'd like to put out there is to leader games themselves. When, uh, when they did finally identify the fact that they had, um, that they had games in the warehouse for us, and we said, great, how quickly can we get them? It looked like they were going to arrive about two days after our exercise started, uh, which was also not going to work since uh, James and his crew had to go through a lot of work to get the games set up. We sleeved all the cards uh, and, you know, punched all the, the markers out of their uh, out of the, out of the paperboard, et cetera. And so when I reached out to the manager of the warehouse and said, uh, look, if you can't, if we can't get them shipped in time, just tell me where you are and I'll drive down there and pick them up. Because again, I did not want to lose my job. Uh, I had already walked very far out on this limb to do something that was kind of outside the box. And, uh, and I could feel the supply chain sawing off the limb behind me. Uh, and they really did kind of move heaven and earth to make sure that we had them not, not on the day that I asked for delivery, but early so that we could uh, get all that stuff ready and do our own train up and be ready to go. And so, um, you know, that's not like an official government endorsement. That's an endorsement from, from me in terms of, I appreciated the help that, uh, that they gave and kind of kept me out of trouble with my boss, uh, in order to make that happen. And, and, and it was greatly appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. And, Seconded, 
<laughs> we we mention that particular piece of gratitude to both of those groups frequently in this. And uh, I don't think I have anything else beyond that. I think we've covered everything we wanted to. All right. For all of you who are watching or for all of you who come later and view this on YouTube, thank you for your time. We hope that you've learned something about how we're doing things here. And uh, good luck. Thanks a lot.